Cape Pyramid 2023 exam. Let's let's run through. So question one. Let P and Q be any two propositions. Complete the two table below. So the first column we're asked to complete here is a third column. P imply Q, the conditional statement. And the thing about the conditional statement, P imply Q, the only time we have a false is for the true false situation. The rest of them should be true. And then here's the reverse Q imply P. So we are working now from right to left, from the second column to the first column. So again, the true false situation will be a false. The rest will be true. A final column, the fifth column here, we are combining the third and the fourth using the connective and. So the thing about the and, true and true is true. True and true down here is also true. But once there's a false in the mix, then the compound statement is false. Hence, state whether the statements Q imply P, that's this statement, the fourth column, and P imply Q and Q imply P, that's the fifth column, we're asked to determine if these two final columns are logically equivalent. So obviously, they are not. Notice the second row, the truth values are different. For, for the statements to be logically equivalent, all the truth values have to be the same. So to answer the question, so the statements are not logically equivalent. Since all truth values are not the same. Let's move on. Let X and Y be negative real numbers. And let Z be any real number. So X and Y should be negative and Z can be anything. Use a counter example to show that the statement, if X is greater than Y, then, if X is greater than Y, then if I multiply both sides by Z, that XZ is greater than YZ. We have to show that a statement is false. All right, let's do a counter example. Let's assign some values to X and uh, Y. So let X be equal to, there should be negative, negative 5. We want to create a situation where the X value is actually greater than the Y value. So let also Y be equal to negative 10. Is negative 5 greater than 10? Yes. So here we have X greater than Y. All right. Let's also create a Z value. Let z be equal to uh, let z be equal to negative two. All right. Now let's multiply both sides by z. So if x greater than y, let's let's find zx. So zx, zx. So here negative five is more than ten. So this corresponds. Let z be negative two. So if I multiply z times x, all right, let me put it in the order, even though it doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative, so, well, let me just have it like this, so xz, xz, that's x times z, right, negative 5 times negative 2, so xz would be equal to, put it here, so xz would be equal to um, positive 10, right, and uh, yz well equal to positive 10. and yz would be equal to y times z positive 20. let's compare xz to yz is it greater so xz is 10 
Why is it is 20? It's actually less than. All right, so that's a, that's a counter example. Because this is saying XZ should be more than YZ. But we're finding XZ based on the conditions that we are given. X and Y must be negative, and Z can be anything, negative or positive. We use a positive for Z. So based on the situation here, negative for Z, sorry. Um, X, we are finding XZ to be actually less than YZ, since 10 is less than 20. All right, so therefore, proven. Let's move on. That's part, or right now part. So we just look at part. So all right, so we're going on to part C now. The expression f of x equal to, and we're given a function there, is divisible by 2x minus 1 and has a remainder of 2 when divided by x minus 1. All right, so it's a remainder and factor theorem question here. So let me just read. So f of x is equal to this. Uh, we are told that when divided by 2x minus 1, so what we could do is, so 2x minus 1 is a factor. Let's just equate it to 0 and solve. So 2x equal to 1 x equal to half, which means that f of half is a solution, of, therefore f of half should be equal to zero. All right, f of half is a factor, since it's divisible, so f of, f of well, 2x minus 1 is a factor, so f of half should be equal to zero. Also, it has a remainder of 2 when divided by x minus 1. So x minus 1, let's change the sign there. So f of 1 should give us the remainder, which is 2. All right, so f of half should give us 0, since 2x minus 1 is a factor. And f of 1 should give us a remainder of 2. All right? So which one should I do first? Let me do f of, f of 1 first. This so is more straightforward to, to work. f of 1. So I'll be replacing x with 1. So 6 times x cubed, that's 6 times 1 cubed. 1 to any power is 1, so that's just 6. Plus p times 1 square. Again, 1 to any power is 1, so that's just p. Plus q times 1, that's q, plus 2. And we're told that's equal to 2. Let's find f of half now. So this time we are going to replace the x with the half. So f of half, so 6 times half cube. So I'm going to sub substitute here. So 6 times half cube plus p times half square plus q times half. So that's half q or q over 2 plus 2. And that's equal to 0. Let's see if we can simplify this. Now, so half to the power of 3, that's half times half times half, that's 1 eighth, and 1 eighth times 6, that's 6 eighths, so that should be 3 quarters when simplified. Plus half square, that's half times half, that's a quarter, times p, so that's p over 4, plus half q, that's q over 2, plus 2 equal to 0. Uh, so one, one thing we could do is try and Simplify this equation by getting rid of the fractions, fraction, so we can multiply both sides by the LCM. So let me multiply both sides of this equation by the LCM of a denominator here, which is 4. So 4 times each term. All right, so 4 times 3 quarter, 4 times p over 4, 4 times q over 2, 4 times 2, and 4 times 0 is 0. So 4 times 0 is 0. 4 times 3 quarter, I think that leave me with 3. 4 times that, leave me, with, leave me with p. And 4 times q over 2, 2 into 4, 2. So that's 2q. And 4 times 2, that's 8. All right, so I can simplify. Let me just, uh, let me just group the constants. So the constants here, 3 and 8, that's 11. So we have 11 plus p plus 2q 
equal to 0. So we can call this equation 1. 11 plus P plus 2Q equals 0. And this equation, if I group, so I, of course I sub, can subtract 2 from both sides here. So this would be 0. So 6 plus P plus Q equal to 0. So we can solve. I guess we could use elimination method to solve this, this pair of equations. So we can put them together and simply just subtract. So uh, so let me just continue. So here, so let me just put them here. So we have 11 plus P plus 2Q equals 0. And we have 6 plus P, P plus Q equals 0. And of course, we can subtract. So if we subtract, create a value above minus value below. So 11 take away 6, that's 5. P take away P, leave us with 0. 2Q take away Q, that's Q. So 5 plus Q equal to 0. And therefore, let's bring over the 5 there. Therefore, Q equal to negative 5. And of course, I can use this now to get the value of P by substituting it into, let me call this equation, call this equation 1, let me call this equation 2. So I can substitute this into, substitute into equation 2. It doesn't matter which one, but the equation 2 looks simpler. So if I use equation 2, 6 plus P plus Q equal to 0, I would have 6 plus P, and then Q is minus 5, so I replace the Q with minus 5 equal to 0. So 6 take away 5, I group the constant, 6 take away 5, that's 1, so 1 plus P equal to 0. Bring over the 1, P equal to negative 1. So the solution is Q equal to 5, well, Q equal to negative 5, and P equal to negative 1. Let's move on. Part D, solve the log equation. And we are given a log equation there, notice. Uh, both of them is base 3. So there's a, there's a rule that says, there's a log rule that says log A minus log B is equal to log. And we can combine both terms by dividing A over B. All right, so, it's, so, so in this case, it's what's in there. And by the way, very important with this rule that the base, we're assuming they, they have the same base, which is the case here. Both of them have the same base, base 3. So we can look at this as a, a and look at the x plus 3 as a b. So we can combine them. So this is log. Of course, it's base 3. And x square, so the first in bracket in the numerator. And what's in the second bracket in the denominator equal to 3. So we combine both logs by dividing. It's one of the laws of logarithm. Now, uh, we should be able to recognize difference as squares. So this same as, so x square minus 9 is the same thing as x plus 3, x minus 3 when factorized. All right over x plus 3 in the denominator there. All right, so x plus 3 cancel itself there, divide into, out into itself there. All right, so what we're left with is just x minus 3. So therefore, we can safely say that log, this is log base 3, x minus 3, is equal to 3, all right? And the essence of logarithm, so we can say what's in the bracket is equal to the base, which is 3, raised to the power on the right-hand side, which is 3 there, all right? So x minus 3 is equal to 3 to the third power. That's 3 times 3 times 3. That's 27. Group negative 3 on the other side. We end up with x equal 27 
plus 3. So we end up with x equal to 30. And we can always check our solution to see if it x equal 30 makes sense. Um, if x is 30. So, so from here, x is 30. If x is 30, let me test it with this here. If x is 30, um, 30 minus 3, that's 27. So we are seeing that log 3 x is 30, 30 minus 3 is about 27, is equal to 3. So notice the base raised to the power on the right hand side should give us 27. Alright, so it doesn't matter where it, where you test it, the answer should, should check out. Alright, let's move on to part 2. So we also show that root 320x cubed plus root 125x cubed simplifies to 13x times root 5x. So notice the third is root 5x. So maybe the best approach is to try and get everything, get root 5 in, in, in all, in both of these terms. All right. So 320, if we divide 320 by 5, that's 320 divided by 5, that's what, 64. So 320, which we can rewrite we can rewrite the 320 as rewrite 320 as 64 root 64 times root 5 and the x cube as root x cube plus the 125 we can rewrite one divide 125 by 5 that's 25 so 125 can be re rewritten as as root 25 times root 5. So since 25 times 5 give 125 here, 5 times 64 gives 320. And then root x cubed. So what else can we say now? Root 64, that's 8. So what we have is 8 root 5 times root x cubed. Well, root 5x cubed plus 5 root 5 times root x cubed. So we're aiming to get this. What else can we say now? Well, maybe I well, well, so root 5x cubed. So that's so with 13 root 5x cubed, right? So root 5x cubed, root 5 root x cubed, root 5 root x cubed, that's one term. So we have 8 of this term, 5 of this term. So we end up with, we end up with just 13 of this term. So we end up with 13 root 5 root x cubed. No, x cubed, that's x cubed, x cubed. We can we can break up the x cube. We can rewrite the x cube as so we can so this is thirteen root five. So x cube x cube is x times x square, right? X cube is x times x square. So we can break it up as root x times root x square. Well, if we combine them by multiplying, we get back the root x cube. So we can rewrite it like that. So this is 13. So root, so get it to look like this. The square root of x square is the square root of x square is x. So this is x. So multiply to the 13 with, with 13 times x. Since the square root of x square is x. So we are left with now root 5 times root x. And root 5 times root x is simply root 5x. Remember with thirds, root a times root b is equal to root a b. So in the same way, we can just multiply on one third. All right, so root 5 times root x, think of the 5 as a and the x as b. So root 5 times root x, that's root 5x. So that's that.
All right, so question two, part A. Let f of x equal to 7x plus 2. Prove that f is bijective. Now, if f is bijective, if f is bijective, it means it's both injective. That's one to one. Injective is the same thing as one to one. And surjective. So we need to prove that f of x equals 7x plus 2 is both injective and surjective. So let's prove injectiveness. All right? So proving injectiveness. So we let So, so first and foremost, not, well, f of x equals 7x plus 2. All right? So we can let, well, f of x equals 7x plus 2. So we let f of a be equal to f of b. And if it's injective, then a should be equal to b. So if f of a, replacing x with a in the function, so 7 times x becomes 7a. And then we have our plus 2. f of b, this time we're replacing the x now with b. So 7b plus 2. And we can, if we subtract 2 from both sides, we end up with 7a equal to 7b. And if we divide both sides by 7, we end up with a equal to b. So since f of a equal to b, we're getting a equal to b. So therefore, F, F, F is injective. Another way to show that, two, that the function is injective is to, is to do a graph. So to prove injectiveness, we, we can do a graph. We'll do a dra dra graph quickly. So x-axis, y-axis, and obviously it's a linear function, so the graph should be a straight line. So the graph will cut the y-axis at positive 2. The value of c when x is 0. And the graph will cut the x-axis when y is 0. So when y is 0, um, the x value will be some maybe negative 2 over 7 or something like that, right? When y is 0, the x value will be something like that. So the graph will be a straight line looking like that. I wrote to show it continues. So this is the graph of y equals 7x plus 2. You know, we use f of x and y interchangeably. f of x equals 7x plus 2, y equals 7x plus 2, same thing. All right, so when you're proving injectiveness graphically, so it's right about writing like a statement. Notice if you, should, if you should draw any horizontal line, so proving injectiveness, you can write a statement. Any horizontal line drawn will cut the graph only once and you'll write like a statement so injective we just this is one method by the way what we just did was we call it is called the algebraic method so this is the algebraic method we just did and the graphical method you'll write a statement that says any horizontal line drawn will cut the graph only once and the horizontal line drawn will cut the graph only once and notice the graph is a straight line so any, any line drawn horizontally will cut the graph only once so the function is therefore injective uh, let's prove surjectiveness now so we, again we can use two methods to prove Surjectiveness. All right, so let's prove surjectiveness. So what we could do is let, so proving surjectiveness. So let's do both method, algebraic method, and uh, and graphical method. So the algebraic method first. So what was the function? 7x plus 2. So let y equal 7x plus 2. And we transpose for x. So if I transpose for x, bring over the 2, I'll have y minus 2 equal 7x. Divide both sides by 7. 
x equal y minus 2 over 7. And then we find f of x. Now, f of x should be equal to y if it's surjective. Let's find f of x. So f of x is equal to f of y minus 2 over 7. Since x is y minus 2 over 7, so f of x is the same as f of y minus 2 over 7. So here's a function, f of x equals 7x plus 2, so it becomes 7, replace x with whatever is in the bracket. So f time, f of, f 7 times x becomes 7 times whatever is in the bracket, that's y minus 2 over 7 plus 2, so we end up with um, 7, cancel 7 here, so we have y minus 2 plus 2 which is equal to y. So here we, have, we found that f of x is equal to y. Therefore, f is surjective. Another word we have a surjective is, is onto. That's the a, that's a, that's a algebraic method. The graphical method, again, the graphical method, we draw the same graph. So let's draw the graph again, graphically. The same graph, it cut the y-axis at 2. Cut the y-axis at 2, just do a simple sketch there, and cut the, the x-axis at negative 2 over 7. If, if you let y be 0, x will be negative 2 over 7. So just a sketch, and we draw a line. Draw a line, cut the y-axis at 2, x-axis there. I to show that the line continues. It's really a line segment we're sketching. And again, we write a statement. Any horizontal line drawn should cut the graph at least once. And notice any horizontal line you draw, it will cut the line because the arrow continues up and continues down. So any horizontal line drawn will cut the graph at least once. So any horizontal line drawn. We'll cut the graph at least once. And at least once could be one or more. But we know it cut it one time if you should draw, so it means it's surjective. So the function is injective and surjective. So therefore, so that statement, since f is both injective and surjective then it means that f is bijective the roots of the cubic equation 3x cubed minus x squared minus 2x plus 1 equal to 0 are alpha beta and gamma. Determine the equation whose roots are 1 over alpha, 1 over beta, 1 over gamma. Alright? So we need to find the, 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 the equation that has those three roots. Now, let's go back to the first sentence. The roots of the cubic equation are alpha, beta, and gamma. Now we know for the cubic polynomial, the sum of the roots, the sum, so applying the, this for, the, for this cubic equation we're given, the sum of the roots and the sum, what's the sum? Alpha, beta, gamma, the sum is equal to negative b over a. And so, so let me just write the coefficient, so a, so the coefficient a, is 3, b is negative 1, c is negative 2, and d is 1. So b is negative 3, so negative b would be positive, so, sorry, b is, b is negative 1, b is negative 1, so negative b would be positive 1 over a, which is 3. So the sum is 1 third. The sum product
And by some product we mean alpha times beta plus beta times gamma plus which one I don't have it? Alpha times beta. So we take a sum in pairs. Alpha times gamma, sorry. That's equal to B equal to C over A. And C is negative two A is three, so negative two third. And the product is equal to the product is, is given by alpha times beta times gamma. And the product is so B over A is so D over A, negative D over A, right? Negative D over A. And D's one, so negative D will be negative one. A is three, so negative one third. So that's applying that to the cubic equation that we are given, given that the roots are alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, we want to use this information and determine the equation, the cubic equation, whose roots are these. Now, the thing about cubic equation, all right? The thing about cubic equation, the thing about cubic equation is that the equation is given by, is, is given as any cubic equation, is given as x cube minus the sum of the roots times x square. So sum of the roots is a coefficient of x square, the negative sum of the roots, plus we're alternating the signs, sum product. And the sum product is a coefficient of the of the x sum product of the roots that is minus product of roots and all of that should be equal to zero all right so any cubic equation can be expressed like that so to find the cubic equation these are the roots one over alpha one over beta one over gamma we need to find the sum of these three values the sum product and the product all right let's begin with the sum one over alpha plus one over beta plus one over gamma so the sum one over alpha plus one over beta plus one over gamma. So we need to find the sum. So one thing we could do is bring everything under one common denominator, all right? So this is equal to the common denominator would be equal, to, would be, would be alpha, beta, gamma. Common denominator would be alpha, beta, gamma. All right, so for us to have a command, for, so, so, so in other words, we need all of these fractions to have the same denominator, alpha, beta, gamma. Now, for this denominator to have alpha, beta, gamma, we need to multiply by beta and gamma, which means we have to multiply the numerator also by beta and gamma. All right, so this first fraction, the numerator, will be beta times gamma. The other one, for it to have the same denominator, we need to multiply it by alpha times gamma. Multiply it by alpha times gamma. And for the thing to remain equivalent, we have to multiply the, the top by alpha gamma. So this alpha gamma. And the final one, we have to multiply it by beta alpha. That means we have to multiply the numerator also by beta alpha so notice in the numerator notice in the numerator what we have here is 
what we have here is in the, in the denominator, alpha, beta times gamma. Now we found from the equation that we're given that alpha times beta times gamma is negative one third. Alpha times beta times gamma is negative one third. So the denominator is negative one third. The numerator is a sum product. And we found the numerator, the same thing to be negative two third. So, so the numerator, the sum product is negative two thirds. All right, so that's negative two third. So what we have here is negative two third divide by negative one third, which is the same thing as multiplying by two over negative one. Just multiply and reciprocate, right? So we end up with, cancel that. So we end up with negative two divided by negative one. We end up with positive two. All right. So the sum of the roots, we found that to be, we found that to be positive two. So when we're writing the equation, the sum of the roots, so this will be two x squared. All right, so this was the sum. Let's find the sum product now. Let's find the sum product, which will be the second coefficient to the sum product. I remember the roots, remember the roots we're working with are our sum of products, these, one over alpha, one over beta, one over gamma. Let's take the product and sum them up. All right, let me just separate this. So, one over alpha, one over alpha times one over beta, all right? So one over alpha beta, plus one over beta gamma, plus one over, what we need now, alpha, Alpha gamma, right? Alpha gamma. All right, so again, the common denominator will be the same alpha times beta times gamma. No, um, to, to, so we want all, the, so no, how it go? To add fractions, we need to have a like denominators, right? So we want all denominators to, to be alpha, beta, gamma. So to get this to be like this, we have to multiply a numerator by a gamma and the denominator. So that's gamma in the first numerator here. The other one, this is beta gamma. So we need to multiply by multiply by alpha, right? So we have to do the same thing in the numerator. Multiply by alpha for the fraction to remain equivalent. And the final one, that's alpha gamma. We need to multiply denominator by beta. And we must do the same thing to the numerator times beta, all right? So we know that, uh, we, we already know that alpha plus beta plus gamma is, that was one third. All right, we found that from the original equation. And the product, we know the product was negative one third. So what we have is one third divided by negative one third. Anything divided divide by itself is one, right? So that would be negative one. All right, so, this, so, so the coefficient here would be, would be negative 1, so negative 1x. Let's find the, 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 this product now of the root. So the product, the product, of course, the product. So the three roots here, if you multiply these, these three terms, 1 over alpha times 1 over beta times 1 over gamma, that's 1 over alpha beta gamma, right? So that's one over, so the product, one over alpha times one over beta times one over gamma. That's equal to one over alpha beta gamma. And remember that alpha beta gamma, what's alpha beta gamma? Alpha beta gamma is negative one third. So it's one divided by a negative one third. So it's one divided by a negative one third. That's equal to, that's equal to negative three, right? So here, um, this would be negative 
3. So the equation is, to answer the question, the cubic, let me write it up here. Well, the cubic equation is, let me put it in a different color. So the cubic equation is x cube, x cube minus 2x square minus 1x minus minus, so that's plus 3 is equal to 0. So that would be our solution. x cube minus 2x square that's a question. Alright, determine the equation whose roots are that. So the equation whose roots are 1 over alpha, 1 over beta, 1 over gamma is x cube minus 2x square minus x plus 3 equal to 0. Part C, the diagram below shows a graph of the curve y equal x, sorry, f, well, y equal f of x don't matter. f of x equal x square plus 6x plus 8. So x, f of x equal x square plus 6x plus 8. And there's a graph. I was to cut the x-axis at minus 4 and minus 2. And you cut the, the y-axis at the constant, which is 8. All right, so that's f of x. What are we asked to do now? So the question asks us to sketch and label the graph of g of x, which is x square plus 6x plus 8. So remember, f of x was, let me put f of x beside it. f of x was x square plus 6x plus 8. That's what f of x was, right? And notice what g of x is. It's just the, 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 the absolute value of of x squared plus 6x plus 8. So the y values must always be positive, all right? So let me use, just change the color a second. So it's the same thing except that, let me use, use red. All right, so notice we don't want any of the graph. Modulus means everything must be positive. Or, well, all the y values must be, must be positive. So the part that go on the x-axis, here the y values are negative. So we simply reflect it in the x-axis, all right? So, so, so g of x would look like that, and then adjust, same thing, extend it right up, extend it right up, all right? So that would be a g of x. So simply reflect the piece below the x-axis, reflect it above, and that is all there is to that, all right? On the same axis, sketch and label the inverse of the function f. All right, so the original function that we're given f, the original function f, we're asked to, so I'm done with, let me just erase this, right? So the original function we're given, f, we're asked to reflect it for x written or equal to 3. So here x is written or equal to 3, so it's beyond this point, all right? So we're asked to reflect it, reflect it, draw and label the inverse of f, all right? So the inverse of f, so here's the function f. Here's a function f. So that's a line x equal to 3. We are told to do it beyond. So that's a line x equal negative 3. So we are told that a line must be greater than, so it must be go to the right of the line x equal negative 3. All right? So we are asked to reflect this line, draw the, 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 um, the inverse of the function. All right? Now, the thing about inverse of a function, the inverse of a function is simply, we can get the inverse graph by simply reflecting the original graph in the line y equal x. So, a line y equal x pass through like 0, 0, 2, 2, 4, 4, and so on, all right? So, a line y equal x will look something like that. It's line y equal x, all right? Of course, you lose a ruler to draw that line. If pass through negative 2, 2, and so on. So, a line it will continue, all right? The thing about drawing the inverse of any graph, you simply reflect the line in the, you simply reflect a graph in the, in the line y equal to x. Now, it's very important to know what happens to a point when reflected in the line 
y equal x. When a point is reflected in the line y equal x, what happened to the point is that the x and the y coordinate change position. All right? So, for example, in this case, notice the graph of f of x. This, this point is 0, 8. So, the inverse would pass through 8, 0. So, that's 0, 8. The inverse would pass through the point 8, 0. But that's 8, 0 is not there. So, let's ignore. Let's use a point. Let's use points that we can identify. Let's find a couple of points. This point, so what's this point? This point is, seems to be negative 1 and positive 3. So, negative 1 and positive 3. When reflected in the line y equal x, it will become positive 3 and negative 1. So, the inverse will pass to positive 3 and negative 1, which would be about here. Let's get another point here. The inverse will notice the original function. The original function. Gone too far. It passes through. This is what? Negative 2, 0. So that's negative 2, 0. If I reflect it in the line y equal x, coordinate swap positions. So it become 0, negative 2. All right. So it would pass through 0, negative 2, and so on. So that's how we identify um, the graph of the inverse function. Let's get some points it should pass through. This is what? This is, this is negative 3, negative 1. This is negative 3, negative 1. So negative 3, negative 1 will become negative 1, negative 3. So negative 1, negative 3 would be weird. Negative 1, negative 3. Would be around here. Sorry, negative one, negative three will be around something like that. All right. So it's as I say, graph will look something like this. All right. Something like that to that effect. So this is the graph of f inverse x. All right. So simply get the graph. Look at your look at the original function, and just switch the coordinates. Plot the points and sketch and you'll have the inverse the inverse graph all right can i do another one all right let's move on given that given that g of x is equal to 2x plus 3 over 3 prove that g inverse of 2 does not exist. So to find g inverse of 2, we first need to find g inverse of x. So let's find the inverse of g. So we let y be equal to 2x plus 3 over x plus 3. And then to find the inverse, we interchange x and y. So interchange x and y. So y becomes x and x becomes y. So it's be 2y plus 3 over y plus 3. And I guess we could cross multiply. So cross multiply. What we'll end up with is 1 times that. So that's 2y plus 3. Multiply at x. So x times both terms. So x times y, that's xy. And x times 3, that's 3x. And then we could group all the y terms and transpose our y. So group all the y terms. Let me continue over here. Group all the y terms, we'll have 2y minus xy. Just bring over the xy here. On the right hand side is a 3x. Bring over the positive 3, it becomes negative 3. So we can now factor out the y since we are transposing for y. Factor out y, we'll have y bracket. Factor out y, we'll have with 2 minus x equal 3x minus 3. So divide both sides by 2 minus x if we are transposing for y. So y is equal to 3x minus 3 over 2 minus x. So therefore, the inverse of g, g inverse x, is equal to 3x minus 3 over 2 minus x. And g inverse 2, so g inverse 2, replace x with 2, so replace x with 2, that's 3 times 2, that's 6 minus 3. Replace x with 2, that's 2 minus 2. 
2 minus 2, sorry. Place x with 2, that's 3 over 0, which is undefined. So that's undefined, right? Which means that g inverse 2 does not exist, all right? So therefore, g inverse 2 does not exist since it's undefined. Remember, 3 divided by 0, the calculator will give you a math error for that. All right, let's continue. So we now want to we now want to question three, model two questions. <laughs> 